Shall we dive in? Thematic analysis. What is thematic analysis? According to Ron Clark, it is a method for identifying, analyzing, and reporting patterns or themes within data. It minimally organizes and describes your data set in rich detail. However, frequently it goes further than this and interprets various aspects of the research topic. Some researchers believe that thematic analysis should be treated as a methodology in its own right from start to finish, and we'll kind of treat it that way for today. But I also think thematic analysis provides a useful toolkit for qualitative welcome. This event is bring your own chair now. So, feel, so standing room only, or feel free to grab a chair and come back. Don't feel weird if you come and go as you have and then we're going to get a bigger room for the next one. Well, I feel like a celebrity. Okay. So, so I also think that in addition to treating thematic analysis as its own methodological approach, it also provides a general toolkit for general qualitative analyses. So you can borrow the analytic technique from thematic analysis for ethnography, for discourse analysis, et cetera. So I think from my perspective, you can either do a thematic analysis kind of from start to finish, or you can use thematic analytic approaches. <laughs> You can sit on the table if you want. I will. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Enough small talk. Let's get into it. So what kinds of research questions can you answer with thematic analysis? Almost any good qualitative question can be answered with some sort of thematic approach, as long as the data that you've chosen is appropriate to that question. So in the example paper that's floating around, the uh, research question is, within the context of the feedback administrators provide to classroom teachers, how do administrators differentiate their feedback based on the subject area? And you can see that that question, there's nothing like specifically thematically oriented about it. Most qualitative questions can be answered using some sort of thematic approach. As long as you have high quality and well aligned data that mediates your research question and your analytic approach. One of the few things that thematic analysis is not well suited for is causal kinds of claims like those that you would see in quantitative inquiry. I'm borrowing heavily from Braun and Clark's 2006 paper here, which is down there. This is called Using Thematic Analysis in Psychology, and I would say this is kind of the baseline paper for thematic analysis. In general, they'll outline six stages. First, you familiarize yourself with the data. Then you generate some initial codes. Then you start to search for and look for candidate themes. Finally, you review those candidate themes to decide if they work for you. And kind of one of the last things you do is define and name the theme. And then you produce the report. I think it's really important to think about producing the report as part of the analytic approach. It's in the writing that you kind of find out the themes. I'll now kind of go into this and take these each step by step. But one of the things I want to highlight is that thematic analysis, like most qualitative inquiry, is an iterative process. You kind of start with a lot of codes and you slowly converge on themes. If I had to draw a picture of it, which I don't have to, but if I did, it would look like that. That's how I would define thematic. No, I'm just kidding. That's not quite right. I would do it like this. You're sort of converging to those themes until you have the perfect picture. I don't know if that's helpful, but there you have it. That's the math analysis. Okay, workshop over. No, just kidding. So I want to take this analytic process in a few steps. The very first step is you collect the data. Most times I see thematic analysis having to do with interview data, but it's also well suited to conversational data, to um, reports and artifacts and kind of found data of that kind. And then you organize that data and transcribe it if it's audio recorded. And then importantly, you partition that data into extracts. This is a really important step because ultimately one of the important quality markers for a thematic analysis is that the data is treated systematically rather than anecdotally. And partitioning the data into extracts can help make sure that the story you're telling is not, hello, is not sort of cherry picked, but rather is systematic across the data. It's what lets you say this theme was present in many of the interviews, not just strongly present in one of the interviews. So I think this stage I'm really highlighting because I think it's really important to partition the data into extracts. How big should an extract be? That I kind of leave to your discretion. But for example, in an interview, 
piece of data, it might be that a question and its answer is an extract. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about like super small level. It's not like every set just has to be an extract, but sort of a nice unit of analysis that you can partition the data into, and that's going to let you systematically treat every extract. Question. Yes. So are you suggesting to actually like pull them out into individual pieces, or say like my transcript, it, all, the things are already like under the questions? Is that does that make sense? Would yeah, so I would not like take when I say extract, I don't mean extract, extract them. Them. I mean like the last time I did a thematic analysis, I had the interview in a Word doc and yeah. I just added a line in between. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. But if you were to do this in like a software package, like an Atlas TI, that might be a quotation. Got it. Would be an extract. Got it, got it. Thank you. And then you're going to code the data. Now we're talking about sort of inductive coding, and by that I mean just like thoughts about the data, things that are sticking out ideas. So these codes are really, really broad. They're kind of any or really specific. There's no, like whatever comes to mind you can code, anything you're kind of paying attention to. So a lot of times at the end of this first coding, you might have like a hundred different codes because you don't really know what you're converging towards yet. That's normal. That would be considered a normal first phase of thematic analysis. So there's a sign in sheet floating around, so if those of you who have scrolled in, you can make sure you sign it. Now, when we talk about coding uh, in qualitative research, that means like a hundred different things to a hundred different people. So here I'm thinking about this as sort of like an annotating process or a memoing process of the data. It's not that the codes are supposed to be shorthand or represent the data. So it's not like you're going to reduce the data to codes as we might in some deductive coding methods. Here the codes are just a quick way for you to kind of work through the data so you can look at all 100 codes instead of looking at the entire data. Set. So be liberal in your coding. Code broadly and widely. Have a good time. <laughs> coding party. This process where you organize, transcribe, partition, and liberally code the data is a really important part of familiarizing yourself with the data set. Let's call that analytic process one. Wow, it got hot in here. Yes. Sorry, everyone. You can actually adjust the temperature right now. It says like 58. So I always say this is just for show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here, I'll practice for Yeah. Oh, freezing. Okay, analytic process two. This is sort of a prettier version of that time. <laughs> so now you have 100 codes. Now what happens? This is how I would do it. I would take those 100 codes and put them in a list somewhere. Or I would write each code on a sticky note. Now what you want to do is kind of start to get those codes to cluster together in some way. So you're going to cluster these codes. Let's imagine you have 100 sticky notes and you might kind of bring them into <coughs> eight clusters of codes together. I'm making up these numbers, yes? You're fine with them. And so you might have some sticky notes that you're not sure where they live yet. You might have a cluster that doesn't have a coherent theme. You're like, I don't really know why I'm putting these two things together, but they seem like maybe they go together, these codes. You're essentially trying to create like a candidate theme, a set of candidate themes. The metaphor I like to use with thematic analysis is that we're trying to get an increasingly refined analytic lens to the data. So those of you with glasses, you might have been to an optometrist and they give you like a, like a lens and they say, is this clearer or is this clearer? You know what I'm talking about? Yes. So our idea is we're trying to get a clearer and clearer lens until we get the right prescription to see the data in an analytically interesting way. So our goal now is we have these 100 codes and we're trying to develop a new analytic lens so that we can go back to the data with a slightly better view. So we're our goal is to kind of create candidate themes. We don't need to create themes yet. We're just creating some clusters so that we're prepared to go back into the data with a slightly different or slightly more nuanced perspective. So here, sticky notes can be helpful for those who are a little bit more comfortable with the kinesthetic. I think if you're in Atlas TI, you can play around with code groups if you're more software oriented. I have found that a lot of people I've worked with really like diagramming at this stage, creating kind of boxes and flow charts and maybe putting things together until you get like a diagram that you're slightly ready to jump back in. Um, Braun and Clark go into detail about some of these things. So as you have questions, feel free to kind of consult that and then we'll have kind of Q and A at the end. I really want to highlight that thematic analysis requires, I would say at the very least, three comprehensive passes through the data and often more. I mean like a full start to finish pass through the entire data set. 
it is an iterative process. So don't hate it. Iterate. Wise words. Thank you, me. Okay, so now what happens? So remember, so first we transcribed and partitioned the data. Now we have like 100 codes. Now we've clustered the codes. And now we have sort of some clustering. It feels fuzzy. You're doing it right. Good job, everybody. Now let's jump into the data again with this better analytic lens. And then you'll go through the data and you'll start to decide if those clusters work. Probably what happens is you have, again, I'm making these numbers up, four clusters that you're like, these are good. These make sense. They treat the data well, they're sensible. Maybe a few clusters that you have to pull together. Maybe you have a cluster that wasn't quite right and some codes are going somewhere else and some codes are part of some other theme. Maybe you have an other cluster and now we're slowly starting to converge to our final themes. And now it might feel premature, but usually at this stage, after you've passed through the data one more time and you're kind of crystallizing those clusters, now we're moving into candidate themes. It may feel premature, but at this stage, I would actually encourage people to start writing up findings, even though you haven't really found anything yet. Like you're not, these are candidate themes. But I find that the writing process should be treated as part of your analysis here, because it's in the writing process that we're going to look at pieces and extracts of data really deeply and see if they really hold up to scrutiny, if they really <coughs> represent the thing that we think that they're representing. So we moved to the writing a little bit sooner. Oh, I wrote this many times because I feel strongly about this. In qualitative research, writing is part of the analytic process. Writing is part of the analytic process. So now this is the part that everybody wants to know. How do I know when it's a theme? How do I know when the cluster becomes a theme? And the answer is, I don't know. Yes, very underwhelming workshop. So it's not a theme until it is. Like there does come a point where you, the researcher, have to make this analytic leap and say this cluster of ideas is sufficiently sensible for me to call it a theme. And now it is an official theme in the data. And there, that is like an analytic leap. And it's not like sometimes you know it when you see it, sometimes you just decide like it's time. And it is, it's not like it's not like you are beset by a vision that says, oh, it's a theme. Themes don't just like come out and say, hello, here I am. You must decide that theme. That's what makes it analytical. That's what makes this research. So you should feel like a researcher. Good job, everybody. So you're making these decisions, and I strongly encourage you to keep some kind of log around that decision-making process, some kinds of reflexive journal, some kind of way of saying, like, this is how we moved into the thematic. This is how we moved from a cluster to a theme. Here, there's lots of different ways you might do that. You might do that by asking friends to look at the data. You might do that through some kind of member check or triangulation. You might do that through the writing process. I find that when you have these candidate themes, you start writing them up. And as you write them up, you discover, oh, this one is not really that robust. I don't actually have that much to say about it. It might be a sub theme. Or this one actually has so much going on, I need to show six or seven examples to really understand it. Maybe it's two themes. And it's in that writing and communication process that you start to crystallize those themes. Another metaphor I like to use is the notion of the lighthouse. So you're deep, deep in the data now, right? And you don't know where you're going. Think of your research question as a lighthouse that is casting out a beacon. That's where you look when you need to get from ship to shore. So when you're stuck in the depths of that data, you don't know, is it a theme? You don't know, I don't know what this code means. I can't make sense of this data. Remember the research question. In the thematic analysis, there's always sort of two questions, right? Question number one is sort of like, what themes best explain this data? But question number two is your research question. What do I want those themes to be speaking to? And so you, in your analytic process, you're always trying to kind of just make sense of the data. But when you get stuck, you can bring that research question in. So can you repeat that? Which question? So you have your research question. <coughs> That's what you're kind of bringing in your expertise and your literature. And then there's always this other question of just like, what themes most comprehensively and, and cohesively explain the data? And so that's like not quite a research question, but you always need to kind of answer that question in your qualitative analysis. When you get stuck with one, move to the other. Does that answer your, really? You don't seem satisfied. <laughs> well, well, I mean, what happens if, the themes that emerge 
or the things that you decide upon don't meet with your research question. Like if you're, if you're trying to understand somebody's experience, but you're interested in this one specific part of their experience, but with their data and interviews and stuff, this is just not something, well, I guess that's significant, right, that it's not significant to them. Yeah, so I have several potential answers to this question. <clears throat> this question of what happens if you come up with all these themes and they don't really speak to the research question that you set out to do. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is like, does the data speak to it? Because if you've chosen an appropriate data set, you should have some way of answering the research question if you have that alignment. I also think in qualitative data broadly, but this varies from field to field, but broadly speaking in qualitative analyses, after spending a lot of time with the data, it's okay to kind of go back and reorient your research question a little bit. It is not like a fully linear process from research question to answer. Mm -hmm. So I have been in situations where I am trying to do something thematic and I sort of am finding one theme and then it turns out what I wasn't looking for was actually themes. I was looking at this one idea. And then I go back to my research question and instead of saying, what are the various ways that you've engaged in this sense making I may get? How do we explain this particular kind of sense making and I kind of move away from that thematic analysis? But that's part of this iterative process. Does that offer yeah, yeah. some comfort? So how do you write things up? I like to use the metaphor of the, oh, it turns out I have more to say about this. <laughs> you write up these candidate themes as part of the analytic process. I like to use the metaphor of the evergreen tree shape, which I will dive into in a second. The question is kind of like, how do you speak with your themes to the literature? This is overly reductionist, but the way that you're gonna write up your themes is like, here's theme one and we'll talk about it. And then at the end of that theme, how does the literature speak to that theme? How does the literature help you interpret the theme? At the end of all of your themes, how do those themes together speak back to the literature? So if you're looking for a way to think about the relationship between the themes and the literature, within the theme, literature on theme. At the end, theme on literature. I'll come back to this in a second, and this might make more sense. Let me dive into the evergreen tree shape. This is to me what the write-up of a theme should look like. You begin with a piece of data. Well, you begin with like a sentence, maybe talking about what the name of the theme is. Then you begin with an extract from the data. It is really important to present extracts from the data. Then you should interpret that extract. So we're getting slightly wider in our analytic lens. Interpreting means telling us what the person said, but also helping us understand what that discourse is doing. Here, if you're in a discourse analytic world, you're citing conversation analysis. If you're in an ethnographic world, you're maybe bringing in aspects of the program that are relevant to what the participant is saying. This is where you're interpreting what is said rather than leaving it to the reader to interpret. And then you should do some analysis. This is where you start to connect that extract back to the overarching theme. Then we'll introduce another piece of data another data extract that speaks to the same theme. This is all one theme. And that data extract should be chosen in light of extract one. So if extract one is like the cleanest, most beautiful example of the theme, then extract two might be, on the other hand, some participants did not feel that way. So it might be a contradiction. It might be deeper. It might be, on the other hand, some participants took more, this is hard to do in the abstract, but the point is, the extract should be showing us how the theme is done in a different way. Either a more nuanced way than extract one or a different way than extract one. And then again, you'll interpret and you'll analyze. Then, depending on how much room you have, if you're in your dissertation, probably a third extract. And then you'll transition to the next theme. So this is my metaphor that I use when writing up findings. This is actually what I would use for writing up almost any qualitative finding, I a graph that discourse analytic, but I think in a thematic analysis, data extract interpretation analysis, new extract that shows us the same idea in a slightly different way, and zoom out and so on. Yes. What's the difference between interpretation and analysis? I would say interpretation stays mostly with regard to making sense of the, the extract. Mm -hmm. And analysis is where you're going to link back to the larger theme or to the larger situated context of the extract. Is that helpful? Yeah. 
So then, if you put it all together, this is what your findings kind of come to look like. Stacks of Christmas trees. Okay. And then this large discussion section where you connect across your themes back to the literature. By the way, people love to ask like how many themes. I can't tell you, but in the absence of any other information, six, six themes. <laughs> but I made that up. Like I can't tell you how many themes are there are going to be. But I'm using five here, but like there might be more than five. Yes. So for the analysis, do I need to draw upon like literature or just like I'm still close to my data? I would say for each of these individual trees, you don't need like a ton of literature. Like if there is relevant literature, bring it in. But this should not be like literature heavy, or it doesn't have to be literature heavy. At the end of all the themes, I think you do need to bring in quite a lot of literature. Yes. That also reminds me of another point about the length of those data extracts. I've seen these vary wildly. Sometimes they're one sentence, sometimes they're whole paragraphs. I think a few lines is probably okay. And if they are the very same length as those extracts you partitioned in the beginning, that would be beautiful. But they should not be longer than 125 words. I made that up. But the extract should be like whole big, big essays from your participants. They should be as small as you possibly can to make the point, to show how the theme is being constructed. Should we only use one? Or should you, like, is, it, is there a sort of general rule, like, in pulling up a data expert, if, if I'm like, okay, well, these three things really represent the thing, should I use all three of those extracts, or should I just pick one that best represents? The answer that I have heard is basically use as many extracts as you possibly can fit okay. before you hit the word count limit. Um, I would say, for me, each theme should have at least two extracts. Right. Having less than two suggests that the theme might not be robust. Right? And you can also be, I mean, I think reviewers will ask, how did you choose a representative extract? I don't think you actually need to choose a representative extract, because if you're presenting a variety of ways that the theme is done, no one way is going to represent. You're showing the range of ways that that theme is done. But some ways you might choose an extract. It's the cleanest or most obvious or most visible version of the idea. So you can say other participants did this, but it took them a paragraph and a half to say it. But here it's done in one sentence. You might choose extracts so that across all of your findings, you've maximized the data you're presenting. So you're not presenting only extracts from one interview of your best participant, but you're trying to show across your whole data set. And when you say extract, it means quotations. Quotations, yes. So I guess I used extracts in two different ways in this talk. Sorry, everyone, but mostly, yeah. So <clears throat> your themes align with your codes, right? So many codes would make a theme. Yes. So if you have an interview that, let's say, on theme one, you have six codes, and you have an interview that hits on all six codes, but it's like a paragraph. Uh -huh. But it's important to show that uh, uh, it's out there. And how can you reduce that? It's, uh, so I think I would say, like, you have these codes from your initial liberal coding, and then you've clustered them, and now they're moving into themes. It is not important that the theme be, like, all 15 of these yeah. codes. You've sort of, like, the coding was, you can toss it aside once you come to the themes. So it's not important that your extracts represent all 16 codes, because those codes are sort of placeholders to get you to the theme. Does that help? Yeah. So I'm back to the writing up finding slide, which maybe makes some more sense. So you're writing up these candidate themes. You're not writing up the themes. You're writing up the candidate themes. And as you're writing, you're discovering whether or not a theme is robust. As we've just discussed, those extracts are writing up those extracts, choosing those extracts, analyzing those extracts is a lot of analytic work. And in that analytic work, you might discover that some theme is not robust. Or you might discover that two themes really go together. So you're writing up these candidate themes. At the end of each theme, how does the literature speak to that theme? And at the end of all the themes down here in this big base, so what does your analysis contribute back to the literature? Rhetorically, you've probably set up a literature review as you introduce your research questions. So here's where you kind of 
explicitly answer your research questions. Now you'll notice this whole time we haven't actually named the themes, because naming the themes is one of the very last parts of the analytic process. I would discourage you from naming the themes early on, because then you're likely to choose data to fit your name, mm -hmm. instead of trying to get data that is patterning together, and then kind of understand the nature of that pattern. Here are some, some ideas for how you might name themes. I would say theme names should be relatively specific. So for example, the theme discrimination is probably too broad. It doesn't tell us what about discrimination. But the theme international students experience deeper discrimination in the introductory writing course is sufficiently robust as to tell us kind of what to expect of that theme. Obviously, in that study, I was doing a study of the international writing course. Yeah, right. OK. So the themes should be more than one word for your theme titles. Think closer to phrases or full sentences. I have heard naming the themes as the metaphor of like a song title. So it should be like a nice representation of the quotes. But then together, you think about looking across the themes. You have like an album or a track list for a record. So if that's a helpful metaphor for you. I say of a concept album because I think some bands have weird titles. So, And then the other thing is quotes from the data. For some people, if you can find a, a nice quote that well encapsulates the theme, that would be a good name for a theme, a quote from the data. So naming the themes comes kind of right at the end here. All right, here's my 15-point plan on quality. Quality in a thematic analysis is assured in many ways. Again, in qualitative research, Quality, validity, and trustworthiness are things that happen across the analytic process and not just at the end of analysis. So it's not like at the end we do a member check and we say that the research is high quality. This is straight out of Brown and Clark, so you can find this. But they lay out their 15 points of criteria for high quality analysis across transcription coding analysis overall and written report. I think the ones that I want to highlight are the data have been analyzed, interpreted, or made sense of rather than just paraphrased or described. So this is what this is where that interpretation and analysis part of that evergreen tree is really important. You don't want to just present quote after quote after quote and not tell us how the quotes go together or what what it is that the quotes have in common or what the underlying meaning of the quotes is for the research that you're doing. The other one I want to highlight is that enough time has been allocated to complete all phases of the analysis adequately without rushing a phase or giving it a once over lightly. You do have to go through the entire data set multiple times, as I said, and there's no shortcut to that. Yeah, and the rest of these are good. Do these things. Some kind of overall tips. This comes out of the Castleberry and Nolan that's around here. I like this article because it's written for what seems like a more quantitative audience. So in some fields, if qualitative work is newer, this article might be more helpful. They have something like 10 tips, and these are four that I really like. Make sure that you answer your research question. Take your time when coding. Don't be afraid to start over. It is not a linear process. As I have already explained, it is a weird spiral with an arrow coming out of it. And allow the readers to trust you in your work. And what they mean is make sure that you're transparent about your analysis process. So you need to say, this is how we moved from candidate theme to theme. This is how we clustered those codes. So I think I'll cut us off here because it's boiling. I will not be offended if anybody leaves because it's hot. So please feel free to pack up. But I'll stay around until 12 for Q&A. Um, just a few resources, and this PowerPoint and the recording will hopefully be up on our website in the next week or so. The Braun and Clark Using Thematic Analysis in Psychology. When I asked Jessica Lester about this workshop, she said, tell everybody to read everything Braun and Clark have ever written. So <laughs> do that, and you'll be all set. But this is probably the, the cleanest, most clear piece. The Castleberry and Nolan is a, a nice guide for, it's from pharmacy teaching and learning, so for fields that maybe are newer to qualitative overall. There's a great, great thread that Kokoli Bhattacharya has where she kind of critiques this notion of 
themes emerging, because themes don't emerge and say, hello, here I am, it is I, your theme. Rather, you have to find them. And she also has some interesting ideas around um, the novelty of themes, like that themes should tell us something that we could not have known if we had not systematically treated the data. Like if the theme is like racism is real in a critical race framework, then that's not sufficiently detailed just to tell us something that we could not have known without having done the analysis. Um, Chad Lockmiller's study is kicking around. This is a good exemplar if you're looking for an example of things like write-up processes. I always want to remind people to read dissertations. You can always access dissertations for free through IU, so it's always good to find dissertations that have used your analytic method with some of your committee members. And it's fairly easy to do. And then, of course, I'll remind you that we offer consultations. Our, my walk-in hours are Tuesday from 12 to 4 down in the Education Library, but we can also set up one-on-one -on -one time or Zoom calls for an extra a week. So I have some quarter sheets kicking around. At this stage, I apologize for the um, heat in the room. So at this stage, for the rest of the hour, feel free to come and go as you please. No worries for those of you standing or if you're hot or whatever. But let's stick around and kind of do a QA and people can kind of come and go. And let me know, of course, if you need anything, if you want this PowerPoint or you need any of these files, you can email drhelp at indiana.edu and I will be here for you. All right, there you have it, folks. I'll take questions now. And if you haven't signed in, please do. And good work today listening to me. Good job, everyone. Oh, I have a question. Yes, I'm just going to turn off. Okay. Yeah. So, 